Waiting for tonight on today's Best Variety. Good morning. It is 8.37. Sean here and in the studio for our final farewell mayor report is Mayor Mark McKee. And you have a guest. So I'm going to let you introduce the guest because, you know, I think it's okay. it, it should yeah. come from the mayor. All right. Thanks, Sean. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I actually have a, my guest is uh, Lonnie Parker, who is uh, also uh, wrapping up her uh, political career as the uh, regional district rep for Area B. And uh, Lonnie and I have uh, uh, spent a lot of time together uh, working on uh, issues be- between our uh, respective communities. And, and of course, I sit at the uh, regional district table uh, across from Lonnie as well. And uh, uh, But we've uh, always... Uh, Sat down, worked out issues, and, and um, but anyways, I'd, I'll let Lonnie speak for herself. Lonnie. <laughs> Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Good. Well, Lonnie, thanks for coming in, and I wanted to ask you a question. We've we talked to Mark enough. You can hear him from like 90 miles away. So, Lonnie, you're welcome, Mark. <laughs> why did we finally to go, why, why, why now? Uh, why now? Well, uh, 25 years of service, I think, is uh, is a long time. It's long enough for me, anyway. You're sort of a quitter, you know? Oh, well, you know, I would classify it as that. Uh, I think uh, we've done a lot of really, really good things over the years. But, uh, no, I want to spend some more time with my family. That's I selfish have, of you. Just, I, I just want you to know that. 25 years, and then you want to spend more time with your family? It's a lot of nerve, Lonnie. A lot sure of nerve. <laughs> but, Started when she was 14. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Lonnie, so how do you feel about it, though? Like, really, you walking away after 25 years, what's, are you, is it bittersweet? Oh, no, I feel, I'm feeling good about it. I think we did a lot of really good positive things over the time, and I think we put our, our community in a place where uh, we can move forward. We've got our processes in place, so I'm feeling that we're in, in a, a pretty good position, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. That's good. So this is sort of a, a, a hot question in over 25 years. What's out of the 25 years, is there something that you can think of that you're still really proud of, whether it was this year or 15 years ago that you still kind of hold up to the top in your on your wall board there? Oh, I would say uh, I guess one of the things is putting a, a, a zoning and planning into all of Area B. Uh, it, it was, I think, a really positive thing, especially for the folks down in Trout Lake, Galena Bay and Beaton, where they were faced with some uh, developers uh, back in the day before 2008 where the developers could come in and put in any kind of development they wanted without even talking to their neighbors. So it was a really good thing and I was really pleased uh, with the process that we went through and got to know, of course, the people in Trout Lake and the the other residents that have summer homes there, mostly from Alberta, uh, quite well through the process. So that was, I think, a real accomplishment given that they hadn't had any kind of zoning or planning in at any time well now that you're going to be uh relaxing and spending more time with your grandkids what's the one thing or one or two things that moving forward you would really like to see implemented or have a strong look at oh definitely i think uh, uh, one thing is updating the ocp because it's old now but uh, we really need to have a comprehensive land use plan for uh the whole area for um revelstoke and area b need to give input into it We have so many backcountry recreation tenure requests with overlapping tenures. We have uh, some controversial logging in areas Mm -hmm. uh, where uh, recreationalists aren't very happy uh, about that. Uh, The community hasn't had an adequate say for many, many years. We did have land use planning years ago, but uh, we've been basically silenced. And so one one of the things that I'd really like to see go forward, and Mark and I have worked on this uh, in the last several months since the summer, actually, trying to get the province to uh, to move forward with us to do a comprehensive land use plan. And we did meet with the premier and the minister about it. So hopefully that's going to be coming forward. And we did have the CSRD fire issue come to a resolve, although it didn't seem to make uh, the media as much as the fighting did. But nonetheless, there was a resolve, correct? Oh, absolutely. There was a resolve. And, and you know, I can say that I, I still think that we're, we're paying a little bit too much and the city probably thinks... Oh, that- give me a break, Lonnie. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> but uh, no, we did uh, come to agreement over that. That took a, a lot longer than I had hoped. And I'm sure that Mark uh, had hoped that it would have been uh, solved a lot quicker. But we did come to agreement. We're in a really good place. 
And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we can say is for 10 years now, our rural residents will have the full service that, uh, that the city has. So it's a, it's a positive for us. Very and one of the clauses, so we don't get into the situation like we did, is that I think that uh, it's seven years that notice is given to start renegotiating the the next uh, term of the of the agreement. So there's lots of time built in, and uh, so that's good because you know we have worked uh, we're, we're neighbors we we work mutually together on lots of issues and and lots of uh, services that we provide in the community for both communities. And uh, so it, it's uh, important that that the uh, city and the uh, regional district uh, carry on with the traditionally good relationship that they've always had. Absolutely. So That's Mark, right. And one other thing too is uh, I, I would just like to add one other thing is that uh, we have uh, building inspection back in Area B. I don't know if you were going to ask me about that question, but part of the fire services agreement uh, with the discussions on that was that we would have building inspection in the regional district. So uh, that process has been started quite a while ago. And now just at our last board meeting yesterday, Area C has uh, has got their final uh, okay from the province to have building inspection put in into their area. So by next year, we're hoping we'll have all the areas except the Golden on, uh, on building inspection. So that'll be really good. Excellent. Positive. Mark, yes. we had a question last week that we didn't quite get to about the water mains. So, or pardon me, the uh, Illicilouette River. Yeah. So let's talk about the, that, the cost, why it happened the way it happened, and break it down into more clear, clear detail. Okay. So this was identified years ago as a development cost charge uh, project because the, the pipe was uh, earmarked to be upsized to provide more quantity of water uh, to Air Heights, to resort, to any development, new development. So, and because it's increasing quantity, it then qualifies as a development cost charge project. So in the, in back in whatever it was, 2005, when it was first recognized, uh, the, the staff of the day came up with a figure saying, well, we think it'll be this much, much, much money. You plug it in, you start collecting development cost charges, and then uh, eventually when that project needs to be done, or you, you on a re- fairly regular basis, you look at the development cost charge and you say, you know what, this project's going to be coming up. We better start getting a better handle on the costing of it. And But because of uh, the economic meltdown in 08, 09, the development cost charge bylaw was never updated. And, and, and I would support that if I was the mayor uh, uh, all through those years as well. N- no point in increasing development cost charges when there's no development that's going on. So fast forward, uh, what's happened is that because of uh, extreme water conditions and fresh shed and, and rush, you know, the, the pipe has been undermined and exposed, so it's, being, it's susceptible to uh, getting damaged. So we expedited that project to get done probably sooner than it needed to be, but it needed to be uh, protected. So we, we applied for, for grants. At the same time, council uh, made a decision, I think two years ago, a year and a half ago, that it's time for the development cost charge bylaw to be updated. This is one of the projects that uh, we uh, looked at to get proper costing on. Well, lo and behold, we we put it in uh, years ago at $112,000, but in today's dollars, a realistic price tag is closer to $2 million. So the development cost charge bylaw was being updated, reflected that amount. It was turned down by council, but the project still needs to be done. Uh, we have a grant that is going to be uh, running out. We had a, we received a nine hundred and seventy two thousand dollar grant. So the bottom line is, we put it out for tender. We're doing some of the work ourselves. It's two million dollars. We've got some. We got one hundred twelve thousand. We can take out of DCCs, which we will nine seventy two. We're still basically nine hundred thousand dollars short. Well, that was one of the questions. Who who made who picked the number one hundred and twelve? That's what I've noticed people asking. Well, who would somebody shorted us by a good chunk of money? Well, I think that what what you're doing is you're recognizing projects and you're getting them into the bylaw. And I you know I can't tell you how it was picked. I can guarantee you is that uh, uh, it wasn't me that picked the number because uh, <laughs> I'm not qualified. But I, I just don't think that people realized at the time the 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 scope of the project. I, I can't answer that. It's uh, I, too far back. 
But the idea is, is that when a project gets closer to becoming realized, that's when you would actually sit down and look at some harder numbers. Like right now, what what's the development uh, cost charge bylaw? The update is talking about a replacement of a bridge. It's replacement of a, a sewage treatment plant. There's all kinds of things that, that were in there. And we're not going to go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get an exact cost when that project is 10, 15, or 20 years out. When we get closer to that project, and the development cost charge bylaw is being updated and reviewed, that's when you would start working on getting closer numbers. So this is just one of the ones that uh, we plugged in a number just to have it on, on the on the project list and knowing that it would be updated later. But regardless, here we are. Uh, if the DCC bylaw had passed and gone through, that uh, $2 million figure would be plugged into there, less the $972,000 grant, but now, because uh, the, the bylaw failed, it's now up to the water users because not everybody is going to be paying for that. It's only the people that are hooked up to the city water system. So, for example, people in the Big Eddy who are paying for their own water will not be paying for this water project. Now, Mark, being that it's your final mayor report here, I had written some compliments for all councillors equally and you as the mayor because I thought, you know, you guys get a lot of a lot of grief. Right? No, I don't think so, Sean. Be quiet, no. Mark. And you get a lot of grief. And I thought I'm I'm gonna write some I wrote something nice. So I started with my own take on everyone individually. So, you know, Aaron Orlando, he's a pretty smart guy. Like he is. My guess is he like never sleeps. He's kinda got that Russell Crowe beautiful mind thing. I was always expecting him to stand up and just start writing on the glass with a jiffy marker and creating all these kind of mathematical terms. And and, and he's got long-term decisions in his I, mind. I, just I can so see you know, that. I had all the glass removed out of the uh, council <laughs> chamber. Yeah, I didn't, didn't, I didn't want like that writing on the glass thing. Okay. <laughs> I, I have to say, Trevor English, he always wears his heart on his sleeve. You know, you may not recognize it, but it is there. And he, and he shows it when he feels and... Sometimes he doesn't say anything, and people wonder why. But sometimes silence can be golden. And while you may have wanted him to pipe up during a dust-up, why would you if you don't have to? Connie Brothers. Connie Brothers always has another question. I mean, hell, we were taught in school that no question is a dumb question. And how are we supposed to learn if we don't ask questions? Scott Duke. Scott certainly is singing a different tune since he first arrived on the scene. He's a great example of... New council wanting to kick in the door, kick A and take names, and then realize that there is a pile of process and due diligence in order to said, take those names. But it's a good thing. It shows that he understands over time that how the machine works. And while we all like to kick A and take names, it isn't always the way that it pans out. Bet you thought I was going to bring up his conflict of interest. Nah, there's no point in that. Gary Saul's. <laughs> He's a pretty interesting guy in general. Is he mad? Is he happy? Is he sad? He is a hard cookie to read. Not that anyone really should be reading any cookies unless you're at the Hong Kong. And Fortune cookies. Exactly. Yeah. And you're having your third plate of regret. Not that the food's bad, but no one should be eating three plates. That's just way too much. That's called uh, a nap on the couch after. But I think Gary's pretty unique. He may not be loud or outlandish, but think about it. Do you really want your funeral director to be? Linda, Linda and Lonnie, you guys fall into the same category. I feel that you guys have earned the right to say you're retiring from politics. You're not running again. You're retiring from politics. So you get to go and spend time with your grandkids, which is far more important. And it's really about hashtag free Garth Nixon. He finally gets to go do his own thing without people asking him, why did Linda vote that way? He can just go and fish. <laughs> Mayor Mark McKee. Mm -hmm. He is fast and witty. He is made for an entertaining mayor, and I appreciated the fact that he was part of my English, but balls to the wall most of the time. And while it differs from how others would have done it, it was still productive nonetheless. Again, Mark holds no bones and says what he thinks. He at least has always been consistent that way. Whether you agree with Mark or not, which... I didn't agree with every decision Mark made, but I respected that he said and he did what he would do and then did it like a Brahma bull. A Brahma bull. <laughs> so that was my, I thought it would be nice as a final thing. I, I thought it'd be nice to compliment 
in a funny way. Council and Mayor and Lonnie. So there you go. A big thank you to those, because it would be hard, I would imagine. I don't think that I would want to sit there and take heat. And also the rest of the families, because I can't imagine reading an article about my dad or uncle or otherwise and reading negative stuff. I would think for me that would be hurtful if somebody was ragging on my dad or otherwise a family member. And I think at times we all forget that there is a dad behind it, a mom behind it, a grandma behind it, a grandpa behind it. And at the end of the day, there are people and we for, I think sometimes we forget that. So. And, I, and I think that's a good point. I, I did actually bring that up uh, a little bit at the last uh, council meeting. But uh, and and, uh, you know, Jeff uh, Battersby, who just wrote two columns in the in the current alluded partly to that as well. And a few other things that I think that uh, I would encourage a, a lot of the community to read and, and think about. And, and it's not just the way that we interact with our, our, our elected people, but the, the people who work at City Hall. And, and they put up with a, a lot of abuse and, and a lot of accolades too, because they, they do a very good job for, for the community. They're committed just as, as much or more than, than the, the elected people are. Everybody Everybody goes to work wanting to do the best for their community and do a good job, and and uh, so my hats off to them. But you know, I do. I am starting to realize the toll that uh, that that this takes on your your immediate family and your friends because sometimes your your friends don't agree with you, and that creates uh, some friction and, and problems. And and uh, but you know, as a community as a whole, we're we're a pretty engaged community, and. 99 times out of 100 that's for the better but you can't expect as a as a mayor uh, regional district director or and even in staff at city hall you can't expect that the community is going to spend the time to learn about complex issues and that's why they're relying on staff and uh, and their council and, and board members to represent them and do what's best for them. And, and sometimes uh, I think that we all forget that that's what we're trying to do. We're all trying to build a better community. And, and you know, development cost charges is a real good example, is that I don't think that the vast majority of the community uh, can, can would want to spend the time learning the ins and outs of that bylaw and the repercussions. And so what do they do? They get their information on social media or on the street. And I guarantee you that that's not the best way to get it. And, uh, you know, and again, I go, I refer back to a Jeff's column that I encourage people to, to read because that's the, the type of legacy that, that, uh, this community has. And it's, but it's also what we should be looking forward to and thinking about is that we're going to be going through as a community. And I'm talking about area B as well as, as the city, we're going to be going through again, a whole bunch of big changes and land use is going to be a big one. And, uh, you know, there's some, some real insight there of the things that, that we think about at the table. And as we're leaving, uh, as a community, we're going to have to start watching uh, how the community is going to grow. Is it the right development? Does it fit in with the vision of the community? And, you know, there's a, there was another article in the paper just uh, a week ago talking about Mount Begbie. And uh, the uh, gondola or ski hill, and and uh, I have never been approached by anybody that uh, represents that uh, that notion. Uh, but I can tell you right now is that I think that it would be disastrous for the community. <clears throat> we we have a uh, a ski resort now that we're still working on integrating into the community and coming to grips with the changes here. I think the last thing we need is a, is another resort across the valley, again, uh, complicating things even more and making big changes in the community that we're not ready for. I totally agree with that, Mark. That, uh, that's absolutely correct. And that, that is a rumor that's out there. Um, uh, I've, I've heard about it. I've been approached about it. And I'm definitely against seeing anything like that happen to Mount Bigby. That's our iconic mountain. And I think the community needs to stand up and just say no when they see projects or processes that are going sideways. And one of the processes that almost went sideways was the amalgamation of uh, agricultural land, reserve land into the city of Revelstoke without a proper process. And what I can say about that is if developers want to come into our community, buy agricultural land and sit on it, hoping that they can make a fortune for their own personal, um, personal finances, then that's just wrong. And they take a risk and they, they, uh, they can uh, sit on that agricultural land if they want, but there definitely needs to be community input into how we develop 
and having some agriculture back in Revelstoke is a really good idea. It needs to be looked at, and we need to have the community behind that. All right, Lonnie, Mark, you got one more comment? Well, just one last thing, Sean, is that okay. uh, you know this is the uh, the last show, and I've been doing this for uh, four years, and I just wanted to once again thank you for and, and Easy Rock for, for having this platform of, of people being able to bring in questions and comments and for me to bring issues out to the table and, and explain it. Uh, I think it shows a real strong community commitment. Uh, on the radio's part, but I think even more importantly, it's on your part because uh, you're the you're the radio station. You're the one that's concerned about the community, and uh, and you know the only thing is that uh, you know the show was really a lot better when Milo was here, and uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but you know, I know you have to carry on. But uh, you know, he's you know when I always say that you know that cute little guy at the radio station, I actually mean Milo. I didn't actually mean you. Well. <laughs> Thanks, Mark, and I'm glad that the story is that Milo was the one licking the back of your head and not me. <laughs> Thank you, Lonnie, for coming in, and congratulations, and have some fun with your grandkids. And, Mark, same goes to you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Sean.